I guess I really got interested in the project when I started watching everything on the news about the Dakota Access Pipeline. Then I found out, oh, this very similar thing is happening, you know, right in my backyard with the Lumbee people in North Carolina. North Carolina has the largest American Indian population east of the Mississippi. Um, native communities here are the invisible people. Um, they have no media coverage, nobody pays attention. I was talking to Dr. Reedhouse, and she had some connections at the University of North Carolina in Pembroke. And one thing led to another, and I kind of started this project. Can anyone tell me what they think the people in these pictures are protesting? Yeah. These two right here are protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. And these two are doing or protesting the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. It is a natural gas pipeline that is scheduled to run approximately 600 miles, uh, stretching from West Virginia through Virginia and into North Carolina. <laughs> Trying to raise awareness, maybe get some kind of resistance or opposition towards the pipeline being built. The Lumbee tribe is community being affected with the pipeline running through a lot of their land, including family land and like cemeteries, cultural sites. We just don't see a lot of emphasis being placed on, you know, how it's affecting them. And that's something I think that's worth kind of, you know, raising fuss about. When I started with Dr. Jacobs and the other professors at UNCP, we took out a, you know, a whiteboard and we were drawing like diagrams of uh, the ACP and we kind of decided on a few goals for the semester. So uh, the first one was to construct a digital map that they could use. I found, you know, schools, uh, churches, cemeteries, environmental sites like the river. I put that with another data set that I found that was about the ACP trajectory, and I just combined all this into one comprehensive map. Nice job, guys. How's everybody feel? Great. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got 45 minutes. It went by really quickly. I didn't realize we were like halfway done. So good, you know, time flies when you're having fun. So apparently that's a big solar farm over there. And beyond like. it is it's that mountain air chicken gas camp. I'm mean, sometimes still working on, but another part of my research here are CAFOs concentrated um, animal feed operations. And she said Mountain Air Farms, I believe, is over there. That's one of the ones that I'm kind of looking at because that's been another environmental concern here. You know, here we've got Sanderson Farms, Mountain Air, and a handful of others. I just, it's the, all these risks, they're adding to the environment where anything could happen to where it would damage their water supply or just their quality of life and, you know, snap of a finger. So this is what we want. We don't need gas. We need sun. One, two, three. Clean energy now. Very good. Hey, Greg. We are on the ground. Nice job, guys. I am the co-founder of the um, American Indian Women of Proud Nations annual conference with Dr. Marianne Jacobs, who is um, the director of the American Indian Studies Program at UNC Pembroke and is Lumbee herself. We are friends as much as colleagues and share our concern for the well-being of the Lumbee people and of their lands. Dr. Marianne Jacobs took us back to her land and her father's place, which is the insight for the pipeline. So how long has your family lived here and owned this land? Um, not too long after um, my dad was born, they moved here on this land. My grandfather worked to this land as a sharecropper. And then uh, the woman that he worked for, she agreed to sell him 100 acres. Do you still know where that sharecropping house stood? Uh, the, ho the original house was up there on that corner. This is the original house that, uh, where Sarah, Mary, and Betty were born. I guess this was on the property too. Then they moved into this house, which is still there. I remember playing around this oak tree. 
uh, that had a tree really that had held significance to the family it over the course of generations. Tree. It says one of the largest in Robinson County, and it says the roots of this tree was endless joy for all the children. So it was a play area. I guess it was a daycare. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It was daycare. The sacred obligation of Native people is to sustain, enhance, and support nature. Nature is not a resource where you only take and never give back. People are quite well educated about um, the Dakota Access Pipeline. There is stunning absence of media um, attention to what's happening here in North Carolina and beyond. This is the new pipeline that came in. Mm -hmm. It went right through here and beyond where the trees are on this side, the new trees, mm -hmm. it goes all the way down through the swamp. The old pipeline actually goes from that blue building right through under my dad's parking lot here. That's right here. Yeah. It's all been within the last 10 years that they even talked to him about that pipeline. The little blue house was there, a pumping station was there, and then you kind of forget about it because they hadn't done anything for so long. So um, I don't even know how many pipelines we might be standing on. You said the work for all this has gotten significantly more, I guess, active in the past 10 years. Yeah. Do you think that's all relevant to the ACP? And the oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. We didn't well. have a name for it. I mean, I, I didn't really start hearing Atlantic Coast Pipeline. All I knew was that these big pipes were coming in through by my dad's house. We gradually heard that the big pipes were not residential pipe, you know, were not for residential um, gas. So initially, you thought all that was like more residential pipeline, yeah. like it would benefit the area, but yeah. it, was, it was all industrial work. It was all industrial. You know, you have the environmental issues like the soil damage and the water damage and the air damage, but you also have the risk of, you know, a natural gas explosion. And while those are rare occurrences, they do happen and they're, de they're devastating. One just happened, I think, in February in Texas, and they said, you know, people were saying they could see the, see the explosion in the air from like 100, like 100 miles away or something. I mean, that's insane. I don't know what they're for, but that's what my dad talks about. They sound like a jet engine. I worry about it. I mean, I, they tell you that it's safe, that, it's, that they monitor it, and I'm sure they do, but um, I just worry about my dad being there. We are right here at it. And what about all of the pipes on the other side of the street? Are those those are all brand new. Those are all brand new? None of that was on the, on the other side. None of that was there. You can see between that house and that pumping station thing there, you can see right over there in that tree line is our family graveyard. That's a graveyard that um, where my grandparents are buried and he intended to have his children around him. For native peoples in particular, the land is also sanctified by the graves of your ancestors. And they are considered to be very much present in those graveyards. So right there next to the pumping station. Yeah, so, uh, that's where they are. The Lumbee community was actually really, really welcoming and receptive to all the protesters. They let us camp on their, in, on their land, the Native American Cultural Center. They had a flag that had actually made its way from the Dakota Access Pipeline protest. It was just a flag, but it still had a lot of significance knowing that it's made its way, you know, from one pipeline to the other. Again, it's one of those things that just made it all, all the more real and not just me working in a library. I mean, I actually felt connected to this ongoing movement.
Yesterday we went to the Lumbee Cultural Center and we met with the chief and some of the active members of the Lumbee community, the Lumbee tribe. And then after that we went to the social campfire where we traded stories. The, uh, the chief of the tribe told us some ancient stories about um, the snake and how it's like a metaphor for, you know, the struggles everyone faces. And there was singing in a language that I was not familiar with, but it was very beautiful. And it was just something that I've never really experienced before, at least in that setting, and it was amazing to be a part of. So my name is Greg Yost. I'm from Marshall, North Carolina, and I'm a volunteer with the North Carolina Alliance to protect our people and the places we live. We're going to be walking today from Hamlet to about four and a half miles south to Duke Smith Energy Complex. This is the conclusion of our two-week walk along the Atlantic Coast Pipeline route in North Carolina. Can you please circle up? Claire, you want to do the protocol? I mean, I was only able to participate for two days, but it had been going on for weeks. And there are people that have been there the entire time. So we marched along the path of the ACP, and we, wa we marched through all these communities that were being affected by it. I mean, seeing where it's taking place over the whole distance of this community is it was very impactful to me just to watch all that. My image for the Religion and Public Engagement initiative is that we are creating a university without walls. That is, we recognize community experts as teachers, as professors of practice in their own right. Um, we value and appreciate um, what a community can do to create uh, stronger learning experiences for our students. And we very firmly believe in the education of the whole person. Well, I'm a huge fan of the religion and public engagement concentration. Take something like religion and then make it into this applicable, contemporary kind of socio-cultural study. And that's just uh, something that I've loved. I mean, as soon as I, I guess, initially got involved with RPE, that's kind of the direction my whole graduate career has like gone after that. And I've enjoyed everything about it. I've gotten to work with different communities. I've done projects on campus. Uh, I got to go to Tanzania over the summer and work with some regional NGOs there. So it's just given me the opportunity to see how religion functions in all these different social contexts around the world. Rather expansive. You know, we're just seeing more and more gas lines and more, you know, signs for it. We've approached it. We're here. Pretty large, pretty intimidating. <laughs> Once we made it to Duke Energy, it was really an awesome experience because a lot of people who had been there for the whole time kind of spoke up and these different people came and kind of give their peace. And that was really interesting, just hearing all these different perspectives and all these voices about why they care about this and why they're opposed to this. That when you take the water from my life, it'll be your water next. When you take the fresh air from my life, it will be your fresh air next. The standard academic education where you're only in the classroom, students want more than that. I don't think it's really a model for the 21st century. And I would think that the trend is more and more towards One, engagement. Two, three. Stop the ACP! Yeah! <laughs> That's cool that studying something like religion has led me to a place like this. Very grateful for it. I don't think I could have gotten to the next step without being here first.